Well, hey, we're gonna we're gonna talk today on this um, on this subject that I think is is really really fascinating. Whenever you look to God's word, today is what they call Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the day, as Pastor Ashton said, that Jesus made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, and the the the, the crowds thronged him with praise. They waved palm branches. They threw their cloaks down in front of him for the, for the donkey to, 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 to walk on. And, and it's amazing to me when you start thinking about this, this Easter celebration. Come on, how many know Easter? Next week is the, is the week of all weeks. It's like the Super Bowl of the Christian faith. You know what I mean? Some people say, well, no, that's Christmas. And we say, no, that's, no, that's, that's Easter because we are the only, listen, we are the only religion anywhere in the world that has a risen Savior. He went to the grave, he conquered death, he conquered hell, and he conquered the grave so that you and I can conquer everything that tries to conquer us in our lives. And next week is the week that we celebrate. We celebrate that. But Palm Sunday, this Sunday, is the week that Holy Week began. It's the week that Jesus makes his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, and it carries him all the way to the cross. It's interesting, though, when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, All four Gospels, all four of them talk about the donkey. But only one of them actually talks about the palms. So it seems more appropriate that we would call it Donkey Sunday. (laughs) Because it's really about the donkey. But what I want to do today is, is give you some lessons from the donkey. Now, I would never be so pretentious as to call all of you donkeys. But I can tell you this, I'm a lot like a donkey. And the more I read this passage of Scripture and, and I think about the way Jesus used that donkey, the more like a donkey I realize I am. Now, you may not be, but maybe by the end of the service, you'll leave ee-aw, ee-aw, seeing yourself in the mirror because we are a lot like the donkey. Let me read out of Mark chapter 11 to begin. It just says, as they approached Jerusalem and, and came to Bethphage and Bethany, At the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you'll find a colt or donkey tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and he will send it back shortly. So I'm going to talk to you about the donkey today, lessons that we learned from the donkey. Um, I heard a story uh, about a a pastor who had showed up to church, a little country church, and he was the first one there one Sunday morning. When he got to the church to unlock the front door, he noticed there was a dead donkey on the front porch. He couldn't even get into the building. So he had a friend. The friend was the mayor in town, and he, he said, well, the mayor will get a kick out of this. So he called the mayor, and he said, mayor, you won't believe it. There's a dead donkey on the porch of the church. I can't even open the door. The mayor said, well, pastor, I thought it was your responsibility to bury the dead. The old preacher just quick-witted said back, it is, it is. But it's also my responsibility to call the closest of kin. (laughs) So today as we look at, today as we look at lessons that we learn from the donkey, the first thing that I want you to understand is the importance of the donkey. Why the donkey? Well, hundreds of years before Zechariah, in Zechariah chapter 9, he had, he had prophesied, and, and, and what he said was that, that he, speaking of the Messiah, Jesus, he said that he would ride into Jerusalem. He would ride in, not on a stallion, but on a donkey. The donkey is, is a symbol of peace in those biblical times. The stallion, the horse, is always a symbol of war, which is the reason if you are the captain of the army, you are always going to, to make sure that you are on the tallest horse among your infantry because he wanted to make sure that he could be seen above everyone else if he was calling into battle or if he was calling out of battle. But the horse was always a symbol of war, but the donkey was a symbol of peace. In fact, when King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, became the king of Israel, they celebrated his inaugural address, his, 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 um, his kingship by him riding into town on a donkey that he borrowed from his father, David. Not a horse, but a donkey. Jesus, I believe, used the donkey because it was a symbol of the peace that he was bringing, not the war that he was bringing. 
not the tension, not the confusion. He says, I'm the author of peace and a sound mind, not confusion and a war-torn mind. So we use the donkey. And the first lesson that I think I learned that, that reminds me, Scott, you know, you really are a lot like the donkey, was this idea that, that in Mark chapter 11, verse 2, it says the donkey was, was tied up. The donkey was tied to a post near the door of the house. And you know, donkeys are often tied up. And I, I find myself being a lot like that because I often find myself being, being consumed with things that I ought not be consumed with. Being, con being controlled by things that I really should be controlling. All tied up. You say, well, Scott, I'm not really that tied up. I'm pretty free. Okay, well, let me give you a little test. If I were to say to you, hey, listen, no social media for the week. Nothing. How hard would that be for you? For some of you, I'd say, hey, listen, no alcoholic beverage for the week. No sips, no wine with dinner, no alcohol. For some of you, I'd say no, no tobacco of any kind for a week. For others, I would say no negative talk about another person regardless for a week. No gossip, no bitterness, no greed, no pride for a week. No expressing your unforgiveness of others for a week. You'd be surprised how tied to things you are that you ought not be tied to. You, you'd be surprised at how many things control you that you ought to be controlling. And you know what we learn by that is in the same way that donkeys are often tied up, sometimes as people we're, we're, we're tied we're tied up by things that ought not tie us up, controlled by things that ought not control us. In my trips to Southeast Asia and some of the, 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 the southern islands, I, I've, I found um, something very interesting about the way they catch monkeys. And one of the ways that they catch monkeys in these islands is they will take a coconut and they will drill a hole in the top of the coconut and then they'll put rice in the coconut and then they'll tie that coconut to a tree. And when the monkeys, you know, come swinging in or however they get there, they smell the rice because monkeys like rice because it's sweet to them. The monkeys go straight to those, those coconuts. They, they, they put their hand into the coconut and they grab the rice and they make a fist. The problem is the hole they cut is large enough to get their hand in, but it's not large enough to get their fist out. And because those monkeys are so attached, so attracted to, so tied to the thing, that, the thing that they want, they won't let go to have what they need. And they compromise that. What, what is it that you're tied to that you ought not be tied to? Well, what is it that you're tied to that, that you're sacrificing things that you don't even realize you're sacrificing because you're all tied up? See, if, you're th if your life's anything like my life, you begin to realize that we're a lot like the donkey. We often live tied up. And God doesn't want us to live tied up, which is what leads me to the, to the second thing that I think is so important about the, about the donkey because, because God wants, listen, God wants, when, when, when he says, Scott, I need you, he needs me to be available to go to him, not be tied to something. Remember when he, when he said, if anybody asks you why you're doing this, you tell them the Lord has need of it or the Lord needs it. But the Lord couldn't use the donkey to do what he needed the donkey to do if the donkey was all tied up. And so many times there's things in our lives that God needs us to do. He wants us to do things he has for us, but we can't do it because we're tied to things we ought not be tied to. Tied to the past, tied to bad relationships, tied to bitterness, tied to selfishness, tied to, tied to pride, tied to things that we ought to be controlling, but because they're controlling us when the Lord sends for us because he has need of us. We can't come to him because we're tied to that. See, I find that I'm a lot like the donkey and that so often I'm, I'm all tied up. There's another thing that I learned that, that's, that, that's good news for the donkey, and that, is, and that is this. There's hope for every donkey. Any other donkeys like me in the room say there's hope for every donkey. 
during the last service, my wife didn't know that I was receiving my text messages. So she, she texted me, I love you. And it popped up on my screen. So I said, well, I love you too, baby. She told me in between services, if I'd known you were going to rat me out, I'd have said, I love my donkey. <laughs> you have no idea how many people said things to me on the way out of the first service. And I said, you've just been looking for an excuse to use that word. <laughs> but there's hope for every donkey. And that, that, that encourages me. It reminds me that it's a, it's a lot like me because the, Jesus, the Bible says Jesus sent the disciples for the donkey. Aren't you glad that God sent Jesus for you? Aren't you glad that Jesus sent the Holy Spirit for you? And you know what that did? It provided hope. That provided hope for every single one of us. You're here today, and it says the donkey was tied next to the door. It said he was tied right there, right there by the door. Well, well, well the, the Bible says it in John chapter 10, Jesus, remember what he said? I am the door. So I got good news for you today. If you're like, Scott, I'm all tied up with something. I'm tied up with this addiction. I'm tied up with this problem. You may be tied up, but you're real close to Jesus. You're real close to the door. That's why Jesus said, I am the door. There's hope, there's hope for for all of us, there, there's, there's hope for every, every monkey. The, 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 uh, monkey, monkeys too, but donkeys. There's hope for every donkey. And, and then it goes on and it says, if you read that same, that same passage of scripture in the King James Version, it's really powerful because it says, tied to a door where two ways met. Where, two ways, what, what two ways do you think he was talking about? The donkey was tied to a door where two ways met. If I'm a donkey, what two ways meet in my life? I'll tell you the two ways, my way and his way. And the best day of my life was when my way met his way because I found out that his way is a whole lot better than my way. That's why I always say, listen, you need to give your life to Jesus, not because of fear of hell. You need to give your life to Jesus simply because life with Jesus is just better than life without Jesus. But he said, he said the donkey was tied to a door where, where, where two, two ways met. His way is a better way. That's why the Bible says in John chapter 8, it, it, it's, it's powerful because, because he says that he is the truth. And the truth will make you what? Free. And if the sun sets you free, you are free in Indeed. It's good news for every donkey. If you're close to Jesus, you can be free. You don't have to be tied up. Whatever it is that's tying you, whatever it is that's holding you, that thing that many people know about and the thing that nobody knows about. If you're close to Jesus, there's hope for every donkey. You can be healed. Because Jesus changes everything. Anybody here can say your life is different with Jesus than it was without Jesus? Because G the, the Bible says this donkey, listen, it says there was a colt tied there that had never been ridden before. You know what that means? It's a wild colt. You ever seen anybody try to wild a, wild, ride a wild colt or a wild horse? What happens? How many knows that colt goes nuts? He goes crazy. But the Bible says when that wild colt, colt listen, that wild donkey that had never been ridden before, Come on, anybody ever seen somebody get on a wild horse? You ever seen a rodeo? They go nuts. But a moment with Jesus changes everything. This wild, listen, this wild donkey that had never been ridden before, one moment in the presence of Jesus, Jesus saddles that donkey, gets on top of him, and the donkey's never the same again. Rides him into town, cool as a cucumber, y'all. I mean, people waving you know, palm branches and blankets and people screaming and shouting. You know what that does to a horse, especially a wild one? You know what it does to a stubborn old donkey? It'll make him go nuts. Not this, not this donkey. Just rode him into town. Waving palm branches, people screaming, throwing blankets out in, out in front of him. This donkey's just riding Jesus all the way into town. Why? Because a moment with Jesus can change everything. A while, a while, listen, no matter how, listen, praying for your son, praying for your daughter, you're like, preacher, you don't know how wild my, my, my son is. You, Scott, you don't know how wild my daughter is. I mean, they're crazy running wild. You don't know how wild, listen, 
Listen, if he can tame a wild donkey, he can tame you. If he can tame a wild donkey, he can tame your wild child. Because a moment with Jesus changes everything. What's that mean, Scott? Here's what it means. It means there's hope for everybody because Jesus changes everything. A true story about a Salvation Army event. They were raising, raising money for Salvation Army and they had a guest speaker come in. It was a speaker that had been really touched by the ministry of Salvation Army. His life had been transformed. He met Jesus. His life changed forever. <clears throat> he was on stage and he was telling people, I used to be a, a really really bad husband and a really bad man and an irresponsible father. The enemy had a hold of my life. I had so many things tying me up and so many bondages in my life. But I met Jesus and, and it's everything changed in my life. I'm a changed man. Well, there happened to be a heckler in the crowd, a man who hasn't had his life changed. He, he was jealous of those who had. He was envious of what this man had. And he from the crowd began to heckle him saying, sit down, shut up. You're dreaming. Nothing's happened in your life. You're the same guy as you've always been. Sit down, shut up, you dreamer. As he was hackling this guy, he felt a tug on his coat. He looked down, there's a little girl in a pretty little red dress. And she said, sir, that's my daddy up there. He used to beat my mom. He used to come home drunk. He used to spend all our money on alcohol. He used to be really mean to me and my sister. You see this little red dress I'm wearing? He bought me this dress. It's the only dress my daddy's ever bought me. You see that woman over there, the one smiling? That's my mom. My mom smiles all the time now. She used to cry all the time because my daddy would hit her and he would never bring home any money and she never knew how she was going to feed us babies. But you see her? She's smiling now. That's all she does is smiles. She smiles when she washes clothes. She smiles when she washes dishes. She smiles when she's cleaning house. So mister, (coughs) if my daddy's dreaming, please don't wake him up. Please don't wake him up. Why? Because Jesus changes everything. There's hope for every donkey. Because Jesus, no matter what, Jesus has the power to change everything. Anybody here been changed by Jesus? Come on, anybody had their life changed because of Jesus? (laughs) Somebody said, I love it. Somebody said one time, God formed me. Sin deformed me. Religion came along and tried to reform me. Education tried to inform me. But Jesus transformed me because Jesus changes everything. Isn't that good? Because there's hope for every monkey and every donkey too. <laughs> now let me give you a, another thing that we, we learn, a lesson from, from the donkey, and that, is, and, and that is this. Donkeys, you have to lead a donkey. Do you notice in that passage it said Jesus sent two disciples to get the donkey? Why? Because you have to, you have to lead a donkey. Every donkey needs, needs a leader. Every donkey needs, needs, to be, needs to be led. But Jesus said this is an important lesson to learn, so I'm sending two disciples to lead the donkey. Well, here's what I've learned about this donkey. I need a leader. I need to be led. Number one, I need to be led by the word of God. The leader of this donkey's life has got to be, number one, the word of God. I've got to be be led by the word of God. People come to me all the time and they they say things like, like, Pastor, what do you think? Scott, what do you think? And I'm like, doesn't matter what I think. What's your opinion? Doesn't matter my opinion. All that matters is God's opinion. It's not what I think, it's what God said. It's not what my opinion is, it's what God has already spoken. Like some of the cultural wars that we're dealing with now, I won't get into a lot of them, but I'll I'll get into some of them. I'll just tell you, people will say, what do you think about same-sex marriage? Doesn't really matter what I think. All that matters is what God thinks. Because God's, God's already said, they shall marry and marriage shall be between a man and a woman. So anything other than that is a violation to the will and the word of God. Doesn't matter. Well, Scott, what's your opinion? I mean, they're really in love. They really, doesn't matter. God says anything outside of a man and a woman is an abomination to him. 
Now, don't get mad at me I, because our opinions are irrelevant compared to God's com- opinion. <clears throat> People talk to me about transgender. Well, what do you think about this transgender? I, I don't have a thought. I don't have an opinion. God, God's already spoken to it. He said he created both male and female. At birth, you got a Y chromosome or an X chromosome. And no matter how much you cut, clip, copy, and paste, if you're a born a boy, you can't make you a girl. If you were born a boy, they can't make you a girl. And I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't say that to hurt or to offend. I don't say that to, to, you know, to say, well, this is my opinion because I don't have an opinion. I have a leader because every donkey needs a leader. And my leader is the word of God. But, but, the word of, but the word of God, and please don't hear me to be arrogant and try to preach to the choir and get an applause from the choir. I'm not, I wouldn't offend anybody. I'm just telling you, our opinions are irrelevant to the things that God has already spoken to. Culture changes, God doesn't. Absolute truth is, listen, absolute truth is what the word of God is founded on. Either God wrote all of it or he didn't write any of it. Well, you don't understand, preacher. It was written by men. Yes, but it was inspired by God. He didn't make a mistake. He knew that culture would change, but he wasn't changing with culture. He says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's why we need a leader. He said he'll be a light unto our path, even in confusing times. But God's word's not enough. I need another leader. And that is I need to be led by the Spirit. I need to be led, number one, by God. And then number two, I need to be led by the Spirit. Why? Because God's Word, listen, in God's Word, it doesn't tell me who to marry. It doesn't tell me where to work. It doesn't tell me what house to buy. It doesn't tell me what I should run for or not run for. God's Word doesn't tell me those things. So how do I know what to do? The Spirit leads me. So as a donkey that's been transformed by the power of God, I need God's Word to lead me and I need God's Spirit to lead me. But I need a leader because every donkey has to be led. You ever seen any of our Christmas or or past Palm Sunday productions? We bring donkeys into here. You ever notice that we never let a donkey come by himself? (laughs) Why? Why? Because every donkey needs a leader. Because every donkey needs to be led. This donkey, this donkey needs to be led by the word of God and by the spirit of God. The Word of God tells me what God thinks about issues of the world. The Spirit of God leads me to do what the Word of God doesn't tell me to do. The Word of God didn't tell me to marry Elizabeth. The Word of God didn't tell me to come pastor this church. The Spirit of God did. So every donkey needs to be led by the Word of God and by the Spirit of God. And that's what we learn from the donkey. Let me give you another one, and that is, and that is this. I, I love this one because the, the Bible says that, that God chooses, God often uses donkeys. Anybody grateful for that? God, God just likes to use donkeys. Anybody thankful that God likes to use donkeys? Some of you still aren't convinced. I'm the only donkey in the place. But God, God likes to use Donkeys. Floppy, ear, stubborn, ugly, sometimes smelling bad donkeys. Do you know why God likes to use donkeys rather than stallions? Because stallions often think that the victory is because of them. Stallions often think that, that it's because of how good they are. Donkeys realize I ain't got nothing to offer. And if anything good comes through me, it's only because of him. That, that's why when you look in the Bible... That's why when you look in the Bible, you'll never, find, you'll never find people in the Bible who thought they were all that before God used them. Always in the Bible, it's people who say, I don't have what it takes. I'm not qualified. I'm not good enough. I'm not the one that you, that you need to use. You need to, you need to try, find someone else. But no, you know why God uses donkeys? Because God, listen, God will not share his glory with anybody. And when God does something great through a donkey, the donkey knows that it's only because of God. So God gets all the glory. God doesn't use stallions because stallions often want the glory. He chooses donkeys because donkeys know. I'm telling you what, he chose this donkey 
I've never been the smartest kid in the class. I've always had a reading problem. I've always been afraid to speak in public, which is the reason I know if God does anything good through this donkey, it's all God and it's not because of me because I didn't have anything, anything worth anything to offer him. So because of anything he does through my life, he gets all the glory. That's the reason God uses donkeys because he's not sharing his glory with anybody. but he often uses donkeys. And I don't know about you, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful that God, he turns, he turns ashes into beauty. God, God, God looks at us and he turns, he turns graves into gardens. The Masters will happen in just a few weeks. And if you watch the Masters on TV or if you've ever been to Augusta National, I'm telling you, it's one of the most beautiful places on the entire planet. Those rolling green hills, more green than you've ever seen in your life. Those those, those azalea bushes that are in full bloom, amen, corner, the rocks, the water, one of the most, but whatever it is that you, whatever it is you find beauty in, whether it be rolling mountain, mountains with, with snow caps, whether it be the ocean, whether it be a beautiful lake, whatever it is, wherever you find beauty. Can I tell you this? Just like Augusta National, your favorite place, you know where it came from? Dirt. It all started as dirt. When I walk through Augusta National, I'm like, good grief, how can anything be so beautiful? Then I think it all started with dirt. Then the Bible says that God created man in his own image from the dirt of the ground. That this donkey right now, whatever I am, anything I become, it all started with dirt. Because God likes to use things that know where it came from. It came from nothing and he made something out of it. Because God's not going to share his glory with anybody. But he loves using donkeys because donkeys, donkeys realize there is nothing good in me, God. But whatever I have, I give, it, I give it to you. I give myself away. We just sang it so you can use me. Why? Because God's looking for things and people to use that won't seek the glory. Yeah, but Scott, you don't understand. You're the preacher. I mean, you're always up on the stage and Pastor Ashton and all these singers and all these prayer people and all these, these people at the doors and the, and the board here at the church. No, listen, we're all donkeys. Just donkeys. Who said, God, if you can find anything worth using in, in me, I give myself to you. You untied me from all the stuff that had me bound and now I'm coming hoping that you have use for me the way you have use for the donkey. And then God, that you'll send me back like you sent the donkey back knowing that I can do something great because I've been used by the great one. But God loves Loves using donkeys. Let me give you another one. This was, this was powerful. And that um, it's this idea that that donkey, that the donkey in this story is, is really part of Jesus' journey to the cross. You know, that donkey is really the thing that, that began Jesus' journey to the cross. And what's amazing is when you look at the way God created a donkey, here's what you realize. God sent his son to get on a donkey, to get on a cross, to lead him to the cross. I don't know if you've ever looked at a donkey. I showed you this a couple of years ago, last year, three years ago, sometime. I've shown you this. But, but if you can throw that picture of the donkey up there. If you look at a picture of a donkey, every donkey, look, from, from the top of its mane all the way back down to its tail, there's a stripe. And then you know it goes across the shoulders of a donkey. Another stripe. You know what that creates? A cross. I don't know if you find it fascinating or not, but, but I find it fascinating that, that, that the Son of God, the Messiah, Jesus, he got on God's creation that, that carried the mark of a cross to lead him all the way to the cross. And I, I think, Scott, if, if, you're, if you're the donkey, who are you going to bring to the cross this year at Easter? Which is the question I want to ask you. If maybe you see yourself in this story, maybe you can find yourself like I found myself as the donkey in the story. The question is, who are you going to load up on your back and lead to the cross this year at Easter? 
What are you going to do with those cards that were in your seat whenever you came in? Are you, going to, are you going to pray about the name that needs to be on there that you need to invest in so that you can invite into a relationship with Jesus? Who are you going to give those cards to at work or in your neighborhood? Who, who will you put on your back if you're a donkey like I'm a donkey and lead them to the cross this year at Easter? It's important to remember God used the donkey as a part of Jesus' journey to the cross on the very first Easter. I'm so glad that as a, as a teenage boy, um, Jimmy Downs, a boy I played football with, came out of a wrecked home and a divorced home, living with his dad, who was always either drinking or using and, and um, sleeping with a different woman every week. And Jimmy had to live in that mess. And, and, and one, one weekend I invited him to church with me. And that weekend, you remember mom and dad, he gave his life to Jesus. And it was just one little football player to another one who decided, I know I'm nothing but a donkey, but man, if Jimmy can ride my back to the cross, I'll sure, I'll sure enough take him there. And I'm so glad that I did. And I just, I just wonder about you. Have you thought about who you're going to load up on your back and lead him to the cross this year at Easter? Who are you inviting into the house of the Lord so they can hear the greatest story ever told? When they feel, somebody who feels like life is out to crush them, here's the story of the one who gave his life for them. Somebody who feels unloved by all, here's the story of the one who loves them above all. I hope that over these next five or six days that we'll all think of ourselves as the donkey who is a part of that journey that Jesus took all the way to the cross. We'll ask ourselves, who are we? Who are we going to bring to the cross this year on Easter? How many know it's good to be in the house of the Lord? It's good to be in God's house. It's good to be in church. You know, we always say goodness, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And we all want goodness and we all want mercy to follow us. But he ends that verse by saying, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. In other words, I'll keep coming back to the house of the Lord. I won't make it a place of convenience, but I'll make it a place of priority. I'll keep coming back to the house of the Lord. How do you get goodness and mercy to follow you all the days of your life? Stay present in the house of the Lord. I hope that this week that we'll think about some people that we can bring into the, into the house of the Lord. Well, Scott, I don't, I don't really know even, I mean, I don't even know how, how to do that. How do I even ask someone how to, how to come to church with me? Well, you know, it's not, it's not that hard. All you, I mean, all, all you really have to do is, is say to somebody, hey, you know what? It, it would really mean a lot to me if you would do something. Oh yeah, what, what can I do for you? It'd really mean a lot to me if you would join me and maybe sit with me in church this year at Easter. That's not hard. Do you know how many people you have in your life who would love to do something for you? It mean, it'd, it'd mean a lot to me. Oh yeah, what, what can I do? It'd mean a lot if you would just join me this, this Easter at church. I, I, don't, I don't know how God might use that. Great story about a young guy who was working out on, he was a farm hand and he was working on a farm and he, um, he um, had another farm hand that was working with him and, and that farm hand happened to have a truck and, and uh, he, he just, his first boy, he didn't have a vehicle but he loved vehicles and he, and he, um, he was always telling this, this old boy no to going to church. Every day this, this boy would say, hey, you want to go to church with me tonight? You want to go to church with me tonight? Back in the farm, there are lots of revivals. You want to go to church with me tonight? And this old boy said, no, nah, I'm not really interested. I don't, I don't really do church. That's not me. And so one day he said, 
He said, hey, let me drive your truck. And the guy said, no, nobody drives my truck. And then he had this idea. He said, I'll tell you what, if you'll go to church with me tonight, I'll let you drive my truck tomorrow. He said, deal. That old boy goes to church with him that night. Preacher gives the altar call. He comes downstairs, down, down to the altar and, and makes Jesus his personal Lord and Savior. And the next day, guess what? Billy Graham got in his friend's truck and got to drive it for the very first time. I'm so glad that some old farm boy with a truck, he had the audacity and the consistency to keep asking Billy Graham to come to church with him when Billy Graham kept saying, no, I'm not a church guy. Why do you tell us that story? Because you, you don't know if the person that you bring to church might not be the next Billy Graham. And just to remember that God wants to, he wants to use, he wants to use donkeys. And, and he used a donkey as a part of his journey to the cross. And God may want to use this donkey to lead somebody on their journey to the cross. Maybe if you find yourself in this story, maybe he wants to use you to help somebody else on their journey to the cross, maybe back to the cross. But I hope you'll consider that lesson this week. And the last one I'll give you is this, and that is, and that is this. Powerful, powerful lesson. After that after that donkey met Jesus, it was no longer about the donkey. It was all about Jesus. You know, it's interesting when you read this story out of, out of Mark chapter 11, you read verses 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, what I just read to you. All of them are about the donkey, but then you get to verse 7 at the end, and it says Jesus gets on the donkey and rides the donkey into town. You know, from that point on, you never hear a word about the donkey again. From the moment the donkey met Jesus, you never hear about the donkey again because the moment that he met Jesus, the donkey realized from now on, it's all about Jesus. See, that's what church is about. This, this church is not about this building. This church is not about this preacher. This church is not about this music. This church is about Jesus. That's why any church you go to that's about a person or about people, you probably need to pick a wrong church, another church, because church is about making Jesus known. Church is about Jesus. Church is about lifting up and exalting the name of Jesus. Church is about leading people to Jesus. Church is about pe helping people on their journey all the way to the cross. Church is never about a person. It's never about a people. It's never about a denomination. Church is always about Jesus. And that donkey, the lesson I learned from that donkey is from the, from the moment the donkey met Jesus, you never hear about the donkey again. Because the donkey realized, wait, it's not about me. It's about Jesus. I'm telling you, this is no sense of false humility or false meekness. I know who I am. I'm not even a first class donkey. I'm lower than that. I know my inabilities. I know what my fears are. I know what my insecurities are. I know what my weaknesses are. And that God uses me to do anything like this is a reminder and a lesson to me every single time I stand up here that God still uses donkeys. He can use this donkey. He can use you. We got to realize from the moment the two ways meet, my way meets his way. It's no longer about me and my way anymore. It's about his way. It's about him. That's my prayer for you. This Palm Sunday is a, is a day that we, we remember that, that Palm Sunday weekend. When Jesus rode into that town on the donkey and thrones of people were all around him and, and they began to shout, Luke chapter 19 says, when he came near the place where the road came down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully, watch this, praising God in a loud voice for the miracles that he has done. Come on, I don't have a problem with a loud voice. If you got to listen, if you got a loud voice at a Georgia football game, you ought to have a loud voice in the house of God. 
If you got a loud voice when you're angry, you ought to have a loud voice when you're happy. I mean, I've been with some of you. I've been with some of you on the golf course, and I've heard how loud you are when you hit a good shot, and I've heard how loud you are when you hit a bad shot. I've been at ball games with you. I've heard how loud you are. If you're quiet out there, well, then be quiet in here. But if you're quiet like my mom, don't be, don't be angry at people for being loud. Because the Bible says it wasn't in a soft, reverent, subdued voice, but in a loud voice of praise, they begin to shout, who is this? Who is this? Who is this man who does these kinds of miracles? You know, and then, in fact, the Bible goes on and it says, if you keep reading, it says that the, that the Pharisees re- said, Jesus, rebuke these people. They're out of order. They're too loud. Rebuke these people. Jesus didn't rebuke the people. Guess who Jesus rebuked? The religious leaders. He said, oh, you guys obviously don't get it. He said, you don't understand. If they don't praise me, then the rocks are going to cry out and praise me. But I will be praised. I will get the glory. And if you don't do it, somebody else will do it. If I don't do it, somebody else will do it. If we don't do it, the birds and the trees and the rocks. But God is going to get the glory. And that's what Palm Sunday is all about. For us remembering where the glory goes. And giving the glory to the one who's worthy of all the glory. Come on, if you believe it, stand up on your feet right now, will you? Just lift your hands toward heaven. And let's begin to give him some of the glory that he's worthy of today, can you? Let's just sing it out loud. Let's let's honor him in these last few moments. Come on, put him above everything and give him praise. 